Adrian Lamo is a threat analyst, hacker, and writer. Since 2011, he has been in hiding, having received threats on his life for his reporting of Chelsea Manning. Because of this, we recorded with impromptu tools that resulted in some lower audio quality, and we apologize, but we feel that the content is worthwhile. Adrian, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. I'd like to get your opinion on some of the themes that I've encountered doing interviews this week on Software Engineering Daily. Let's start with Ashley Madison. From a security perspective, why is the Ashley Madison case important? Well, the importance of the Ashley Madison hack and resulting database dump is not so much in its scale or methodology, even though the methodology to this point remains a matter of debate, um, as it is in how simultaneously mediagenic and mediapathic it is. Um, there have been database thefts and database dumps that easily rivaled it or surpassed it, such as the credit card numbers or passwords. Um, it's the moral element that kind of throws journalists and on, onlookers alike and thus kind of makes it a convenient morality play for the security industry and for journalists covering the security industry to use to tie it into readers' lives and the public's lives to say, look, this is why security is important, because if you don't pay attention to it, this could be you. That's basically what Bruce Schneier said when he came on the show a couple of days ago. Um, his opinion is that the Ashley Madison case is important because it's a case in which the attacker, who at the current hypothesis, I think, is that it's it's a disgruntled employee and that was just going after Ashley Madison itself, but all the customers, all the people in the database essentially got caught in the blast radius. Um, it, do you agree with this this perspective that, that the real uh, story here is all the collateral damage? Like, are there any other cases where there's been this much collateral damage from a hack? Well, there, there have certainly been a number of hacks where there's been this much collateral damage, if not more. It's just that the damage in this case is much more media friendly. It's clickbaity. It's something that the Daily Mail can do endless articles on and have guaranteed eyeballs because who doesn't like to read about people who could be their friends and neighbors engaged in um, disreputable conduct and then be able to go out and plug in the email addresses of their friends and neighbors and verify, or at least in the case of some sites, think that they're verifying that said friends and neighbors were engaged in disreputable conduct. Um, and I have heard the speculation that it's an inside job. I believe uh, John McAfee in particular has been going after that angle for a while now. Um, I don't have any first-hand insight, and I, I won't pretend to. Um, but uh, Statistically, inside insider attacks are the most prevalent of computer intrusions. You hear a lot about outside hackers and attacks from the hacker community, but in reality, uh, employees are the biggest network security threat. Most of the women on Ashley Madison were actually bot accounts, and I asked Bruce if this was a form of a security infiltration in the sense that a a user logs onto a dating website and expects that he's talking to a human and ends up talking to a bot. In some sense, this is a masquerade attack. Um, but may, Bruce argued that this was basically I was stretching the definition of security. But what's your opinion on that? I mean, d does this discussion fit in the purview of security? It's hard to um, to, to really stretch it into that definition. Um, one could certainly say that it opens the question of a user being able to really know who they're talking to at any given time on the Internet. And it falls into the larger question of the importance of uh, cryptographic verification of communications. Um, I, I personally believe in trying to use uh, programs like off-the-record, for instant messaging, OTR, um, as well as... Uh, PGP or GPG, I, I particularly um, like uh, 
Keybase.io for the ease and efficiency that, that it brings to using uh, encryption and verification of user identities to a web interface. Um, and on dating sites, a person really has no way to readily tie uh, the average user to an identity. There are some well-established users and there are some sites that claim to do, that actually monetize on that precise uncertainty that claim to do background checks and verify that their users are not in fact married. Uh, sort of the um, mirror universe version of uh, Ashley Madison. Um, and there have in fact been some clever hacks. I, I forget the dating site, but somebody used the API for one to automatically connect men to one another while showing the profile of a female. And some of the resulting chats were pretty hilarious. Uh, that was Tinder. <laughs> yes, I was thinking Tinder, but I didn't want to unfairly <laughs> cast dispersions <laughs> on them. And, and of course, there, there's a saying almost as old as the internet that all, all of the teenage girls are online or men FBI agents or male FBI agents. Probably true. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious... Do you think that, uh, you know, will we need to have some sort of system for verifying humanity in the future? Well, the, really the, the easiest way for people to do that is to, they don't, they wouldn't even necessarily have to have it, do it in a big brotherish way of verifying their real name and their real address. Somebody could re- just lay claim to a pseudonym that they wanted to use uh, on an extended basis on the internet, cryptographically verify it, tie it to the accounts that they wanted to have it associated with. And even if it wasn't a legal name, it could still be an identity that they felt represented them, and they would be able to identify the accounts that they wanted to have speak on their behalf. And... um, Similarly, uh, other users would be able to sign that identity, as is already done with PGP keys, and say, yes, I vouched for this person. They're the kind of person that they say that they are, and I'm, I'm vouching for their trust and their identity. And that, in turn, would be reciprocated as kind of a crowdsourced form of identifying trusted users in a community. And if that was something that was made simple enough, uh, kind of the way that Keybase is doing, it's currently in, in a closed uh, alpha test, too, but um, I've been trying it out, and I've invited a, a couple dozen users to try it out, and so far, everyone I've seen has had good results, um, apart from um, simply encrypting messages and verifying them. It also allows you to claim your online profiles, such as on... Um, Twitter or Reddit or other online services and make, by making a cryptographically signed post that then ties back to your encryption key saying, yes, the person using these, this key in these accounts is consistent with this identity. And uh, having mentioned them this many times, I, I should say I, I have no <laughs> relationship with Keybase. Well, no, that's totally fine. Actually, uh, it's perfect because the previous interview was with the Keybase founder, Max Crone. So this is a really good dovetail. Um, tell me more about your experience with Keybase. Like, tell me about the onboarding. Um, I mean, you've been involved in security matters for a long time. What is so good about Keybase? What is so usable about it? Previously, when I wanted to get people to use encryption when communicating with me, I typically had to determine what operating system they were using, um, get them to download a version of PGP or GPG, get them to create a key, figure out how to uh, interface it with their email program, um, and get them to kind of understand the nitty-gritty. And on some operating systems, it could only be done from the command line. Um, on, on Keybase, I basically just send somebody an invite they they go to the website, um, they sign up, they can generate a key right there from the web interface, or they can tie it into an existing key. Um, and even if they use a pre-existing key, Keybase never knows the actual passphrase. Um, and by having the, the public keys for 
users who have signed up there, even if they don't have, um, pre previously like on PGP on local computers, you had to have the keys of people that you wanted to communicate with in order to encrypt messages to them and verify their messages. On Keybase, you can encrypt and verify messages to and from any Keybase member. So um, what it's done is really taken uh, PGP and GPG and encrypted messaging and made it scale to a web front end that's accessible to new users, people who haven't really been involved in encryption before. I've shared it with people who are not technical and they've gotten it up and running without any, asking me any questions. And I think that's really the, the hallmark of a, a product with good onboarding. Um, I have yet to share it with any Amish grandmothers, but if I do, I'll probably write an article about it. That's, that's funny, because I asked Max how he would explain encryption to my grandmother, and he, he gave a pretty good answer. So uh, maybe maybe Keybase is good enough for even uh, an Amish grandmother to use. Um, so do you think that an important feature of Keybase is the fact that it's sort of this collective point for all your other accounts, which may or may, or may not be verified? I mean, we were just talking about, you know, do you need to verify your humanity somehow? Maybe hypothetically you would need to send in a blood sample or something awful like that to, to, to verify humanity. But conceivably... Um, a more effective way would just be you have so many accounts that are verified on various sites. You know, you've got Facebook, Quora, Twitter, GitHub. All these things can aggregate to form, you know, something that asymptotes towards a a verified human real identity. Um, do you see that as a as a kind of killer use case for Keybase? Quite possibly. Um, when I, well, it wasn't an entirely key base based <laughs> uh, process. When, when I was early in my use of Quora, uh, they contacted me because somebody had apparently seen my name on answers and wanted to know if I was the real me. And they asked me to do like a FaceTime or Skype session to confirm my identity. And um, I sent them back a, a, a cryptographically signed message uh, linking back to my Keybase profile, which linked back to various other profiles. Um, I cheated slightly because I also included um, my, my verified by Facebook, Facebook profile. Uh, but uh, on the balance of things, they accepted this kind of web of reciprocal verification in the place of actually seeing my face. So, I mean, in theory, I never had to be an actual person at all. I could have been cockroaches in a skin suit. So, you, so you're saying that you think your presentation of yourself, uh, versus the way that you verified yourself using Keybase, um, that was you don't. So you're saying that you think that was sufficient uh, in this case for Quora, but was probably not as strong a verification as being displayed in a video conversation. Personally, I think it, it was actually better, um, and, and it tied back to a strong, um, almost decades-long experience of identity on the Internet, um, and I started using Facebook in, in 2004, and I started using the, the Internet in 94, 95, and there are relics of my past that tie back to my various identities around there. I mean, that's not the case for every user, but uh, I think that there's more to be said for a kind of Carfax-like report for a human being's internet experience than a face that could be put together by Hollywood. Okay, that makes sense. What I still don't understand is what is keeping somebody from making a Keybase account? You know, in, in that scenario, if you would have been a masquerade, uh, Adrian Lamo, um, couldn't some couldn't that masquerade person have just created the Keybase account, uh, linked it to that Facebook account somehow, uh, or 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 was this somehow using a a, a private key? that you had created 10 years ago. Is that what you're saying? 
In my case, I was using a private key that I had used for several years and that um, used the concept of key signing, which I, I mentioned earlier, which was signatures from people that I knew saying, I signed this key, I vouch for the fact that this person is who he says he is, and I'm, I'm staking my online identity on that fact, and they in turn had been vouched for by other people. Um, so it, there, it is kind of more of a web of trust than um, just a single person and some Facebook profiles and uh, some online friends with photos of improbably hot supermodels in Uzbekistan. As this key-based future evolves and you know encryption becomes more mainstream, what are the use cases that we can that we can have that will leverage this usability of encryption? There are already a lot of services that build themselves as single sign-on. Um, you can use your Twitter account as single sign-on to many services. You can use your Facebook account for the same. Uh, but certainly there are services that would like to rely on some degree of verification that the person signing up is in fact, a, a human being and not a recently reanimated zombie um, with, or something in between. And much like on many services, uh, your presentation depends on the, the amount of quote-unquote karma that you've accumulated on the service. Basically... Uh, similarly, being vouched for by other users, but in most cases not cryptographically, uh, with a single sign-on service that in incorporated often um, cryptographic uh, vouchers from other users, services say like Quora or at one point Google Plus, which make or also Facebook, which make a a, a significant point of having users use their real names and or at least the names that they go by and having kind of a point of contention being, you know, at what point does the use of a name become a real name? How many people have to call you this before it's your name? Setting a degree of karma that you would accept um, in order to have a user be able to si sign up under a given identity would kind of ameliorate those sorts of concerns. So another theme this week has been car hacking and Internet of Things hacking. Um, Vint Cerf, who you've done some uh, work with, uh, when I did an interview with him a while ago, he was talking about being concerned about refrigerators launching denial of service attacks on banks. What do you think of these types of problems, these, uh, these increasing numbers of attack surfaces because we have processors in in every device now? Well, I think that to security professionals who have spent any amount of time just kind of browsing the surface of the Internet, the concept of an Internet of Things is, is not going to be uh, a hugely new um, or thing. There's already a lot of devices that have computing only as a secondary function, and they've been around for a long time. Uh, universal power supplies, printers, um, larger, like, industrial-scale devices, such as controlling power for a municipality. Um, I, I've seen a lot of odd devices uh, looking at net blocks and... Mm, corporate and other networks, and certainly having it extend to the consumer end is going to multiply that, and Lord only knows that if vendors haven't learned how to deploy uh, network-enabled devices in, in corporate environments without not installing backdoors and not bothering to tell their users to at least maybe require a password before extending root access, it's that it's not going to be great for consumers for a while. Uh, but uh, I think Internet of Things is kind of a term 
being used as like a last ditch effort to introduce the concept to the public saying, um, you know, for, for the love of God, please pay attention to this. Uh, we'll pretend it's new just so you will look at it. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I'd like to talk some about your more recent work, specifically Project Vigilant. What is Project Vigilant? Well, uh, Project Vigilant partners with uh, entities in the public and private sector to um, ultimately look for scientific solutions um, to address problems like, say, um, attack attribution and prediction, um, and also uh, looking at open source and other kinds of intelligence in order to uh, deliver products to our partners that allow the internet to be a safer place and address both existing and future concerns. Um, We uh, work a lot with uh, people in developing countries to get kind of an ear for what um, is being done in terms of internet censorship and ways around that, looking at uh, solutions and deliverables that um, can help ameliorate that, can help uh, disseminate information and help information get out. Um, I uh, primarily have looked at the uh, information reception side rather than uh, technology solutions, but it's helpful to know what the actual internet experience of a person on the ground is, how how they experience the internet, what it is they're trying to do, what, what their obstacles are, um, rather than simply looking at it from a the perspective of an international observer um, who carries their their own passion, their own passions and prejudices regarding the situation. Um, there's there's no sub. Can you give some examples of of uh, of countries or or places where there is a level of censorship and and maybe there are some uh, boots on the ground type. Uh, examples that lead to more friction in communication that, you know, someone such as yourself would not intuitively realize, but something that you've realized from talking to these people? There's a spectrum of of countries that practice their own kinds of reactionary information policy. Um, one, one thing that has kind of struck me in, in the recent past has actually been the European Union's uh, implementation of its right to be forgotten uh, under um, some of the, its uh, data protection laws, where a, a, a user can demand that a search engine like Google remove content from its search results. Uh, basically, if they're not happy with it, and can make the case that it's no longer immediately relevant to them or regarding their life. Uh, so that's kind of a counterintuitive perspective. Um, and you would look at it and you wouldn't think that, say, a country like France would be put on a page of concerns that, say, contains um, Russia or um, similar countries. Uh, but it, it really kind of smacks of, say, uh, certain world leaders who have had a tendency to airbrush people out of a photo once they grow inconvenient. What compels you to work for Project Vigilant rather than other types of opportunities you could be working on? Well, I, I, take an, I do take a, so an array of opportunities. Project Vigilant is not primarily a, a full-time thing for me. Um, I I write uh, a fair amount, and I'm looking at, at branching out into that. I found that one of the things that has generated, um, I think, the most impact on people's lives is 
been some of my writing. Um, it has the most tangible results in getting to think, in getting people to think and derive it, their, own, their own conclusions while still providing them with resources to explore in the process. Um, and it, there are, Looking back, I've come to a sort of strange realization about my life up until now. There are many things that I've, over the years, just because my life has been so strange, kind of accepted as normal. And when I write about them, uh, people are, are just kind of taken aback. Like, how, how the hell did that happen? Or what, what did you do next? Or what did you learn from that? And... Writing about them helps me see them in, in a new light, and people take interesting lessons and reactions from them. Um, and similarly, it helps me realize things that I've learned over the years that I didn't actually know that I've learned and share them. But um, not, neither do I plan to, to slow down on my active work, such as with Project Vigilant. Um, I... I, I, I never wanted to be a, a bystander in life, and that's at the core of my work with TV and other entities. Um, news is not something that happens to other people. Um, if you don't like what you see, sometimes when you look at the world, it, um, it's incumbent on you to do something about it. Yeah, and I think that writing also is doing something about it. What's interesting is that the, the beautiful thing about software is you write something, and then you can copy it for free and distribute it to as many people as you want to, as many people at, that want to consume it. So it's kind of something that is economically unheard of in the sense that it scales so gigantically since, since copying software is so cheap, except that actually it's the same as how writing scales. You know, copying a piece of paper is is very rarely... Uh, you know, that expensive, but you could have tremendous value uh, of impact on somebody's life by giving them that piece of paper, you know, go, going back in time as, uh, as far as we want to, 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 to any, you know, you know, any writer. So, so I think, I think it makes sense to, uh, to go into writing and do, do, you know, you're also doing impact there. As a threat analyst, are there any types of software that you use that people who are not involved in the security industry would be using? Uh, you know, during the time of uh, most of my uh, classically reported network intrusions, um, it, I, I've, I've, I've said it so often that it's almost kind of become an in-joke, but most of what I used was just Internet Explorer and a copy of Windows Notepad. Um, there's a lot that can be done from a web browser. And I get a lot of questions from people about what software they should use to hack, and I think that's really limiting their perspectives. Um, the web is an infinitely fascinating place, and if you're able to master it from an address bar, software will complement what you do, but you won't need it outside of what you have in front of you. A good craftsman does not blame the tools. Let's talk some about the United States and its security policy. What are the responsibilities of the United States government towards its citizens on the Internet? Well, you know, um, one rather specific thing that uh, I've been thinking about that uh, I've been asked about a couple of times uh, is the relationship between the United States government and its hacker community. Um, Main countries uh, like China, like Russia, and in rather an enforced case like North Korea, um, also uh, right, like France, like Israel, and like others, kind of have a cordial relationship with their domestic hacker communities. Um, um, I, Elliot Tenenbaum, for one, um, who went by the handle uh, Analyzer, was uh, actually praised by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu after. Uh, breaking into a number of U U.S. networks. He, he um, is, I believe, an Israeli citizen, and after later 
he was charged with uh, very significant fraud, I believe, in the million, in millions of dollars. He received a very minimal sentence, and which I think was uh, eventually returned to Israel, which I, I found something that you, to be something you would never see happen to a U.S. hacker. And I've been asked, um, and I'm actually working on a guest post about this at, on blogs of war, uh, what um, U.S. government and the U.S. intelligence community could and should do to repair its relationship with the United States hacker community. Um, as uh, John Arkea of um, the Naval Postgraduate School eloquently pointed out in the documentary Hackers Wanted, um, after World War II, we worked closely with a German rocket scientist who previously had been inventing rockets that were used to attack Allied cities. And uh, shortly thereafter, they were our guys, and they were helping us go to the moon, and what they had been doing prior was forgotten. Uh, in the far less extreme case of the U.S. hacker community, we are seeing increasingly draconian laws, radical interpretations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act intended to encompass broader and um, far more nebulous things that were clearly never intended by Congress when they created the law. And it's only further radicalizing the hacker community and decreasing the base that the U.S. government can recruit from uh, in uh, defending U.S. network assets and addressing the growing hacker gap between uh, hackers working for the U.S. and those working for other countries who may have adverse interests. And that's something that I intend to write about at some length uh, in the near future, again, at Blogs of War. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, what is behind the the increasing encroachment of the U.S. Uh, on its uh, native hackers? Why, why can't, or why do we not naturally tend to form the same types of positive relationships with our hackers that other countries do? Well, um, some of our agencies can and do, but it's done quietly um, and on a limited basis. Um, many of the prosecutions that take place are driven by the FBI, which has long institutional memory and is not known for its friendly relations with hackers. Um, and it is known for uh, political prosecutions, which is something that has been demonstrated in hacker investigations and prosecutions over the past five years and to a lesser extent over the past uh, 15 years, and as far back as the 1990s going into Operation Sun Devil. Uh, they they have a long memory. They have an unwillingness to appear to have compromised, and they're continuing to double down at a time when doing so ongoingly endangers national security, and the mature thing to do would be realize that sometimes in life you have to compromise and accept ideas not your own. Are we at war with ISIS right now? We're to an extent at proxy war with ISIS. Um, most of our uh, conflicts in the Middle East uh, before the 21st century uh, outside Iraq were proxy wars. Um, we're uh, engaging in limited conflict in areas that ISIS control, but... We, we've engaged in a lot of limited conflicts, and um, I'm, I'm not even going to get into the, the distinction between uh, declaring war and authorizing force, because that line has been blurred past the point of no return. There's, um, at this point, the distinction between war and conflict is simply a matter of how much force you're allocating and how willing you are to see it through. One thing that seems new about this ISIS conflict, war, uh, blurry dispute, whatever you want to call it, 
is this emphasis on social media. ISIS has very aggressively used social media, very effectively used social media. There are some Aspen Security Council talks. Uh, in one of them, I think the FBI director or some head honcho at the at the FBI says that ISIS is more dangerous than Al-Qaeda. And part of the reason, or maybe the dominant reason, is the effective use of social media. So what does this portent about the future? Does the U.S., do we have to do some sort of, uh, is there going to be some kind of guerrilla tactics to retake control of social media or to inhibit the ISIS's use of social media? What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, the, the official line on that continues to be that uh, ISIS use of social media um, provides a valuable avenue to collect intelligence uh, regarding their activities, um, the actors involved in their operations, uh, and uh, a whole slew of other things. And that, that has been the case in a number of instances, uh, although um, obviously those instances have been played up and uh, shouldn't be considered representative of the entire effort, such as when a photograph was uh, posted which contained geotagging uh, by the senior member of ISIS, and that member was killed in a resulting airstrike uh, not long after. Wow. Um, but um, I think another uh, factor is that if there were an attempt to clamp down on, on use of social media by ISIS, uh, number one, it, it wouldn't be very effective. The whole uh, point of the internet is that it tends to interpret censorship as damage and route around it. So uh, appearing to tolerate their use of social media for a reason is the more um, publicly reasonable position than attempting to censor them and failing, which would only weaken the United States position on the matter. And there is in, in actuality, the, the net benefit of, of collecting information based on their social media use, um, there is a, a direct correlation between how much they talk about how cool the things that they do are and how much is learned about the things that they do. Do you define security as a defensive concept? No, uh, security has um, passive, offensive, defensive and uh, um, points in between components. There's security predicated on research. There's security based on going out and looking at the threat. There's security based on defending against the threat. And there's security based on observing the threat. And there are numerous other incarnations. Anybody that tries to pigeonhole security into one definition is probably selling something. How do you view Stuxnet in retrospect? Or maybe maybe Stuxnet is is Stuxnet to some degree still alive and well? Are there still areas of the internet that are affected by Stuxnet? Well certainly there are are still instances of it that are going strong. I, I haven't personally looked at how strong uh, malware isn't my thing. Uh, I don't like to talk outside of my areas of expertise or at least strong research. Um, whether it was effective really depends on what the actual intent was. Um, one could certainly um, accept that it may have actually been intended to achieve its effect of damaging um, technology intended for uh, facilitating uh, development of nuclear materials. But it also could have just as well been uh, a information operation intended to be discovered, kind of as a shot across the bow, saying, you know, slow down, we could easily do this again and make it worse. Um, one should never buy in too much into the most obvious narrative when it comes to things that are discovered in relation to the intelligence community. There are um, always layers of intent. 
What is your impression on the changing landscape of private contracts? Do you think that Google and Amazon will eventually become more official military contractors? Um, it's possible that they may end up with divisions that become more official military contractors. I, I doubt that they would let their core brands be so associated. What is the most imperative aspect of security that we have not discussed? For me, the most important thing is that people are responsible for their, their own security. Um, using security software, antiviruses, and failing to exercise any common sense in the sites you visit or the sites that you, um, or the files that you download, and then acting surprised when your computer uh, has toolbars from end of screen to end of screen is uh, really a, a failure of common sense. Uh, the, the internet can be a tricky place, and um, as with any kind of protection, you, 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 uh, you wouldn't put on a condom and then throw away any kind of discretion in sexual partners. Where are the borders for personal responsibility? We've seen computers that have malware installed at the hardware level that a user probably, there's no way you could have conceivably anticipated having malware installed uh, at the hardware level when you buy the computer. So aren't there some situations where you know, the end user just really isn't as responsible, or is that the end user's fault for not buying an Apple laptop? These things happen. Life is unfair at times, but wouldn't it be worse if all of the things that happened like that actually happened because we deserved them, to paraphrase the character in Babylon 5? Do you think that as the population grows, the the uh, the connected population Will the internet become more or less secure or stay the same, or is it just too hard to predict? The internet is one, not one um, monolithic, homogenized surface. There are, are parts that will probably spring up under service providers that ensure greater security. There are parts that will probably tend to their own security better. And there are parts that will probably be running Windows XP in 2030. Um, like with any neighborhood, it depends on where you go. Right. So to close off, this show is particularly about software engineering. Most of the stories I've read about you talk about your work deconstructing systems. Do you have much interest or passion for building software systems as well? Coding is not something that I'm good at. Um, I can read code. I can sometimes sniff code out in a black box kind of way by analyzing how web applications and others work. Uh, but building has just never been my strong point. Well, Adrian Lamo, thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for having me. I, I enjoyed it, and I hope we can chat again.